Well, thank you all for coming this afternoon. My name is Candace Summers, and I'm the Director of Community Education at the McLean County Museum of History. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's final webinar, part of the activities for the 2021 Cogs and Corsets, a Central Illinois Steampunk Happening. In addition to the museum, we'd like to thank the sponsors for this year's event, Bloomington Public Library, Meltdown Creative Works, the Downtown Bloomington Association, and the City of Bloomington, with additional support from Artisan, Eastland Suites, Ken Chu Photo, Hanger Art, and the Little Art School, and the Zoo Lady and her crew. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to go over the format for today's program. We will be recording, which we are now, so uh, this program can be shown to people who could not join us live today. If you have a question for our speaker, please submit it in the Q&A box located on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the program. If you're having a technical issue, say with sound, drop a comment in the chat box and I'll see if I can help you get through that. With that, I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, labor historian Mike Matika, who will present today's program on urban transit moving in the city. Uh, Mike Matika serves on the McLean County Museum of History's board and is vice president of the Illinois Labor History Society, along with many other community positions. Uh, his father was a St. Louis transit worker beginning in 1947 as a trolley motor man and a 15-year member of the Amalgamated Association of Street and Electric Railway Men and Motor Coach Employees of the United States and Canada, Division 788. And with that, I am pleased to welcome Mike Matika. Good afternoon, and hopefully we can have a fun time here looking a little bit at uh, how people coped with crowds and getting about an urban environment in the 19th century as cities grew. So I'm going to start this out, a memento from my father here. We're going to ring the official trolley gong. So now let's clear the streets and get ready for a little trip on urban transit. Okay, and again, I'm gonna dedicate this to my father who you see pictured here, who came back from World War II and went to work on a job that I think he aspired to, which was operating a trolley car. And uh, again, did it for 39 and a half years and uh, eventually got his gold card, 50 year union membership. Um, so there's a photograph of him on the left there in a 1920s car that he once operated. And the uh, picture at the bottom center is his 80th birthday, which we tilled at the Museum of Transportation in St. Louis. And he gave everybody rides on a vintage trolley for his uh, 80th birthday. So the big challenge in the 19th century is urbanization. People are fleeing from the countryside. People are immigrating into cities and cities are growing proportionately and rapidly. How do people move about from a pedestrian environment into an urban environment, which increasingly gets larger and larger? How do goods move about? How do people move about? And how do you do so with any semblance of order in that process? Um, here's a picture of um, Chicago, South Water Street, this would have been the South Water Street market in the 1890s. Just look at all the horse-drawn um, wagons there that are delivering goods to the marketplace. You can just see the amount of congestion that's taking place. Just for a few numbers, um, the city of London is the world's largest city in the 19th century. And from 1815 to 1850, grows from 1.4 to 3 million people. New York in 1820 is about the size of Bloomington Normal. 122,000 people, but 40 years later, there's a million. And at the bottom there, you can see the growth population of Chicago from 1850, and then 30 years later in 1880 and 1900, 1 1.9 million people. Chicago is reputed to be the world's fastest growing city in that second half of the 19th century. So how do people get around? And I'm gonna look kind of at three different choices here. Um, do you move on the ground? which the photo to the upper right is a horse-drawn um, trolley. Do you go up? 
the picture at the center bottom is an elevated train, or do you go down? Do you go underground in the uh, subway? So what are the different devices and ways that people put together to be able to move about in urban environments and move about in a public way? Um, beginning in the 1820s and 1830s in Paris and London, the first method was what was known as an omnibus. This was basically an elongated carriage with some windows on the side that would uh, folks could enter through the back and grab a little seat and go on down the street. And in the bottom left is a photograph from a Bloomington omnibus line, which was operating at that time period. The challenge with this is streets were made of cobblestone. So bouncing along on a uh, horse-drawn carriage was not necessarily the smoothest ride. So the intent then was to lay rails and have the horses pull a um, car along the railroad tracks for a much smoother ride. And the first one of these is in 1807 in rural Wales of all places, but then in 1880, 1832 in New York City, 1835 in New Orleans, and in 1867, Bloomington and Normal Street Railway opens with horse and mule drawn cars that uh, connected the two communities here. This would be a photograph here is a, uh, from St. Louis. This would be a typical car of the time period. Notice it's relatively small, um, four wheels, and uh, the operator would stand on the front to um, take care of the mules or the horses that are pulling it. There would be a conductor who would collect the fare for people riding on it. Um, beautifully painted, beautiful woodwork there. These are wooden cars that are being used the big challenge with these horse-drawn cars was sanitation. Um, generally, horses or mules could work maybe a five to six hour shift. So if you were running cars for 12, 14, 18 hours a day, you needed up to two to three um, sets of horses or mules to propel it. And the average horse, if it's doing this kind of heavy work, produces 20 to 30 pounds of manure daily plus two pints of urine. And then imagine all the horse-drawn wagons, carts, and other vehicles on the streets, crossing the street and street sanitation becomes a major issue. And maintaining stables and keeping that many horses around was a very big expense for these early public transit companies. So the next evolution, and we associate this with San Francisco, is the cable car. And a cable car operates basically off huge giant wheels that propel a cable through a slot underneath the street. And the first one opened in San Francisco in 1873 to cope with the hills in San Francisco. Um, it, no horses to maintain. Um, the challenge with it is that you couldn't go fast, you couldn't go slow, you could only go as far as the uh, cable would move. And if the cable broke, not just one car, but the whole system would come to a halt. One thing we forget is that Chicago had the largest cable car system in the United States. We associate the cable car with San Francisco, but really the Chicago system from the 1880s till 1906 was the most extensive cable car company, um, cable car system in the United States. Um, still survives in San Francisco, but uh, the limitation was kind of the speed, and the problem is, again, if one cable broke, the whole system broke down. So the challenge then was to figure out, as electricity became viable, how to power street railways with electricity. There were a couple challenges with this. Number one, how do you get the electricity to the car? Um, because you're looking at some relatively high voltage to be able to turn the car motor and the car wheels, and the wheel system are the trucks, which I'll point out here on the bottom of this Bloomington and Normal Street Railway car. They're going to take a lot of bouncing up and down, stopping, starting, and so how do you build a car system or a wheel system that can withstand the uh, traffic that it's put through? The gentleman on the right here, Frank Sprague, is really the gentleman that perfected this technology. Um, a number of people were trying to do it. And of course, there's a lot of fear in the public of electrocution. So how to do this in a safe way. 
and Sprague in 1887, 88, went to the city of Richmond and took over the Harse Railway there and turned it into an electric system, which once that was successful, sent off a whole series of these across the United States. So two of the things that Sprague developed was number one, this electric wheel set or truck. And the other one was the trolley pole, which is kind of hard to see here, but basically a spring that pushes up a metal pole on a slide or a wheel that touches the overhead wire where the electricity is to be able to propel the car along. Um, his system was successful and suddenly created this great boom in uh, trolley construction or streetcar construction all over the uh, United States and the world. Um, just to give you a sense of maybe some of the early cars and what they look like, um, the large photograph here is what's called an open car. And in the early days, most systems maintained two sets of cars. This would be the summer car with no sides and bench seats so that people could enjoy the breeze. Um, and then they had closed cars for the winter. Oftentimes some cut glass or stained glass and the Claire story up here along the top of the car, um, very elaborate paint schemes um, and just a lot of fine work went in, particularly in the early days to uh, kind of show off the car and attract the public and uh, make it not only look safe, but also an enjoyable and a colorful place to uh, take a ride. Public transit today, we think of as a public service of something that's run by government. But in the early days, transit was get rich quick. And as these systems were being built around the country, um, business people, people who wanted to get rich, it was kind of a dot-com kind of boom of the 1890s and early 1900s to build um, electric trolley systems. So just gonna talk about three people who became kind of Famous or infamous in this world, on the left we have Charles Yerkes, and Charles came from a Quaker family in Pennsylvania. He almost went to prison um, after the Civil War because he was left as a young man in charge of investing and taking care of the city of Philadelphia treasury. He um, did some things he shouldn't have done with that money. Um, it was almost ready to go to prison when some of the members of the Grant administration were potentially pulled down with him. And to avoid embarrassment, uh, he was let off. He came to Chicago, bought up many of the cable railways, and then built the first elevated trains in Chicago and controlled the, many of the surface lines, many of the city trolley car systems in Chicago. Um, his methodology was bribery. Um, to run rails or to build an elevated structure over city streets, you had to get a franchise. You had to get permission from the city to do so. And particularly in many large cities, this was an opportunity for what was known at the time as boodle or graft. So what Yerkes did as he was building, building the South Side Elevated, many city council members and important people were lining up to get their share of the of the wealth that was to be, his response was simply to print stock and he'd hand out stock certificates to city council members and other officials and greatly um, put the system underwater with the amount of stock he was putting out that people thought they were getting into a very lucrative system. Theodore Dreiser was a uh, Chicago newspaper writer at the time period and Dreiser observed um, Yerkes and eventually wrote a trilogy of books about Yerkes, kind of a fictional character about Yerkes and about um, how he operated. And uh, he was kind of driven out of Chicago, went to London and became in charge of the London subway system and actually expanded it and rationalized it. But his legacy is pretty much of someone who is comparable to a railroad robber baron at the time period. The gentleman in the center is Central Illinois, William McKinley. And if you go to the University of Illinois campus, you'll find the McKinley Center there. Very politically connected, became a congressman, then a United States Senator, was the campaign chair for um, William Howard Taft's presidential campaign. And he eventually controlled the city street railways in Bloomington and Decatur, Champaign, Danville, Peoria, Alton, Galesburg, 
and multiple other cities and then connected them with his electric interurban intercity railroad system. To be able to create the electricity, he started his own power company, Illinois Power and Light, which is Ameren today. Um, doesn't have the record of corruption that Yerkes had, but again, became a very, very powerful person, not only in the state of Illinois, but nationally during this time period. And finally on the right, we have Samuel Insull. And Insull consolidated electricity, not only delivery, but use throughout Chicago in the period of 1910, 1920s. So his, he set up a holding company that controlled Commonwealth Edison, controlled Chicago Transit, controlled the commuter electric railroads running into Chicago, had a large share of Peabody Coal Company, and thus was able to get a coal supply to run the boilers for the uh, Commonwealth Edison system, and built his own railroads and barge lines to haul the coal from Southern Illinois into Chicago. His holding company was considered a very secure company. People invested in it. And then when the Great Depression hit, it collapsed. And uh, thousands of people, over 600,000 people, lost their savings who had invested in Insul's company. Insul fled the country, went to Greece, was extradited, and came back and, and stood for trial in this country, was not indicted. But legislation like the Public Utility Holding Act was a federal law about these kind of consolidated systems and that regulated um, electric provider companies that came out of kind of the uh, activities of Insul. And for those that are movie fans, um, there are some folks that speculate that the uh, Citizen Kane film was not so much was built around William Randolph Hearst, but was a composite of William Randolph Hearst and Samuel Insul as kind of the two characters that became the uh, prototype for the uh, main character in Citizen Kane. What was it like to work on the street railways? It was not necessarily a very pleasant job. Um, people worked 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. The photograph or image on the right, the drawing on, I'm sorry, on the left here, um, the car fronts were basically just a platform. And the worker, no matter the weather, whether it was searing hot or cold, stood out on the front to either move the horses along or later to operate the electric trolley system. Um, in 1892, they organized the Amalgamated Association of Street and Electric Railway Employees of America. But railway, street railway strikes were very common in the late 19th and early 20th century. And because they shut down city transit and there was only other option was a horse or to walk, um, they became very public battles. And the photo down here on the lower right is a drawing from the Chicago Tribune during a transit strike in 1885 when the Chicago Police Department was put out with billy clubs and pistols to escort strike breakers through the streets to keep the cars running again. And of course, angry mobs then descended upon those, uh, those street railway and big fights between the uh, Chicago Police Department and not only the workers, but people that were supporting them. Photo on the left is here in Bloomington in 1917, when uh, railway, street railway employees organized a union in April 1917. They were making about $2.30 a day for a uh, 12, 10 hour day. And a very famous lady, Mother Jones, very famous labor leader came to town, gave a great speech. People poured into the streets by the thousand, attacked the strike breakers who ran the cars. And the next day the uh, National Guard was brought into Bloomington. You can see from the photograph here, this is outside the old courthouse, um, set up machine gun emplacements. Eventually the community support was apparent and the William McKinley, who ran that system recognized the right of people to have a labor union and the Connect Transit City bus drivers in Bloomington Normal are still members of that uh, organization. The other thing the um, spread of street railways did was number one, they spread out the footprint of the city. And so in the upper right here is an ad from Chicago newspaper in 1911. And this is a new suburban development on the city of Chicago. And the highlight of this is that um, 
there's ready transit service if you want to buy a home in this area. So people could live further out from the central city. If you're in Bloomington Normal, at the lower right here, you've probably done, driven down Clinton Boulevard and seen this grass easement down the middle of the street. That was a street railway alignment. And same way on Franklin Avenue in Normal. That's where the, the uh, Bloomington Normal um, street railway ran. So now you could live in one of those nice houses on Clinton Street and uh, commute downtown every day for a nickel to uh, go to work or go to recreation. And so the footprint of most communities expanded during this time period. On Sundays when people weren't working, the street railway still wanted to make money. So many of them developed um, amusement parks, dance halls, Chautauquas, um, for people to have a place to go and to fill the cars again on the, uh, on the weekend. So the photograph on the left here is what State Farm Park today was known as Lake Park. And in 1902, the Bloomington Normal Street Railway went south of town, basically into a rural, rural area to reach this. And this large dance hall was built so that people would have a recreation spot on the weekends. And then again, fairs, circuses, all those kind of activities were held there and the way to get there was through public transit was to ride the uh, trolley. Um, just a little bit look here at um, fashion. Um, railroad or street railway workers wore uniforms that were very similar to railroad conductors, kind of adding that uh, sense of authority by what they wore. The photograph, large photograph here is actually after the Bloomington Street railways were electrified, but they were shut down for um, service one day for repair. And so all the street railway workers got out the old horse car and a set of mules and rode around town together in their uniforms, kind of uh, enjoying uh, their, their trade and their work and supposedly singing and serenading the community as they went by. The gentleman in the left here ran street railways in Ohio eventually moved to California and uh, opened a grocery store. His name is Frank Nixon. You might have heard of his son, Richard, who became president of the United States and of course became a president who resigned his office. But again, kind of a pervasive opportunity, pervasive job that a lot of people took place in. For those of who are into the steampunk world of fashion, there is a fashion craze in the early 20th century called the hobble skirt. And this was a very tight skirt at the ankles, which limited women's movement. And climbing up the steps to get into a trolley car was, was a big issue. And one of the largest issues in public transit was how quickly can you get people on and how, people can, how quickly can you get people off. So New York City came up with what became known as the hobble skirt trolley was the trolley here where you would step up to enter, but you would not have additional steps. All the seating was at that lower floor level and uh, quickly took on the name of the fashion and were known popularly as, as the hobble skirt cars. And another kind of fascinating thing from the same time period is when you go on public transit, people from all backgrounds and different economic class men, women, everybody's thrown in together. If a man gets too friendly or overt with a woman, one thing a woman had at that time period, and for those who like to look at the big flowered hats that women wore, they would put their hair up in a bun, put it under the hat, and then put a hat pin through the hair and the hat to hold the hat in place. Well, a hat pin was a handy little weapon if a man got too close to a woman on a car for a little probe. And about the 1910 period, there were lurid newspapers article about these infamous women who were killing men with their hat pins, who, who were carrying around nine and 10 inch long hat pins, stabbing men um, and creating um, death on public transit. So a number of city councils across the country passed ordinances regulating hat pin length. And you can see the news clipping from the Chicago Tribune here of 1910 on the right that uh, tells you that the hat pin ordinance has passed and that uh, no woman can wear a hat pin unless it has a cork 
over the end of it and cannot protrude more than one half inch from the crown of the hat. And uh, interesting, the two no votes here were Alderman Coughlin and Alderman Powers. Powers was the go-to alderman for the street railway companies. Alderman Coughlin was better known as Bathhouse John, um, was one of the most corrupt aldermen in the city of Chicago. So I don't know why he voted no on this. Maybe he didn't get his payoff or maybe he was defending the women who were trying to protect themselves. Um, it was interesting to me that Bathhouse John's main sidekick, um, Michael Hinky Dink Keenan, did not go along on this vote with him. And I wonder why our city council people don't have nicknames like Bathhouse John and Hinky Dink anymore, but that was the uh, reputation of these two infamous city council members in Chicago. But again, this, this idea of people from different groups coming together in public transit is, uh, creates a lot of social turmoil, a lot of etiquette book statements about how people are supposed to conduct themselves on public transit, again, particularly aimed at women and how women act. And again, women trying to, in a sense, defend themselves, becoming a social issue where men have to maintain control by controlling hat pins. Um, the interurban railway, just one slide here, but particularly here in the Midwest was a big boom in the early 20th century of building intercity um, electric railways, which were known as interurban railroads. And um, most of them were centered in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. The second largest was the Illinois Traction or Illinois Terminal System. And the photograph in the bottom here is the, uh, there's one of the Illinois Terminal cars, which ran from Peoria, Bloomington to Decatur. At the height of the system, there was a car back and forth from Peoria every hour. So if you want to go over to Peoria to see a show or a local basketball team was going to play in Peoria, they rode the interurban over back and forth. And uh, this lasted in Bloomington until 1953. The largest system in the country was the Pacific Electric Railway, which was in the Los Angeles basin. It basically was a real estate company. And it built over a thousand miles of electric railways around Los Angeles, mostly to reach out from the center city and uh, create new housing developments. So when you go to Huntington or Redondo Beach or many of the smaller cities around Los Angeles, those were basically built because the Pacific Electric Railroad reached in and developed those properties and uh, created public access through them but very intertied between real estate interest and the, and, the, uh, and the railway system. And just for fun, if you've ever watched the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, there's a subplot there that not only are they gonna build a freeway through Toontown, which is a pretty relevant issue as we look at how freeways were constructed in this country, but they were gonna replace the uh, electric railway with a freeway system. And of course, that's what happened in Los Angeles. But if you watch that film, that's a fun little uh, subtext of that movie. By the World War I era, the trolley was the main um, transit system in the country. It reached its peak in 1923 with almost 45,000 miles of track. Almost 300,000 people were employed in these and over 11 or 12 billion people a year were riding electric transit to get around town. Um, it was part of almost any city of any size. If you were gonna go anywhere in town, you rode the trolley. And just a few specialized cars here in the upper right. This is from Montreal. This was called the Chariot and was a sightseeing trolley. So if you wanted to come as a tourist or you could charter this car for a party, which was something people frequently did, to ride around town in this brightly lit, illuminated open car to see the sights of Montreal. As cemeteries grew in outlying areas of cities, often they were linked by the trolley and there were specialized cars for funerals. So right over in this upper part of the car here was a side door that opened up to be able to allow a casket to be placed in and then the mourners would gather together in the back of the car, which was often draped in, uh, in curtains with um, very plush seats and dark colors. 
to ride the trolley to the burial place. And in many cities, trolleys became the local way to distribute mail from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, and perhaps unique to its history, St. Louis had a beer trolley that went around at night delivering kegs of beer to taverns. Just the pervasiveness of that technology and system is one of the most popular cartoon strips of the time period over here in the lower right is the Tunerville Trolley. It was a uh, cartoon that ran in hundreds of newspapers across the country of this broken down rural trolley system that uh, somehow managed to get itself from town, from little place to little place with a cast of uh, characters that lived along the trolley line. Very, very popular in its time period. Um, by the 1920s and the emergence of the automobile and in the 1930s, already many of these private street railways were going bankrupt, were losing money, um, and were not surviving, and were being seen as antiquated. So at the beginning of the Depression, a group of executives from various um, transit systems around the country got together and anointed themselves the President's Conference Committee and decided they needed to come up with a more modern um, trolley or streetcar system or a, a type of car that would appeal to the public. And so they came up in the late 1930s, what were known as the PCC car. And you kind of see the Art Deco lines with the uh, headlight with a little wing around it, um, very smooth, all electric, accelerated and braked much smoother than the traditional trolley system, used a much better electrical technology, um, much more comfortable ride. It was an attempt to reclaim the streetcar as a viable, um, viable way for people to move around. And the photo here is San Francisco, still keeps a number of these vintage cars operating on, on one of the lines, actually two of the lines, as almost a tourist attraction. Over 4,500 of these modern trolleys were built between 1936 and 1952. 29 different cities in the US, Canada um, purchased them, but by 1970, most of them had gone to the scrap heap. And they were only running by 1970 in seven cities in this country. Um, a great example is Chicago. Chicago had the largest fleet of these modernized cars, over 600 of them um, by 1948. By 1958, they were all gone um, as Chicago got rid of its um, electric trolley system. So this was kind of the last attempt to revive and revitalize this type of electric transit. Um, what killed the trolley? Um, there's often a lot of talk about the famous conspiracy to kill the trolley. But if you look at it, the motor bus, instead of the trolley, you know, the bus did not have fixed rails, and the company was not responsible for maintaining rails. Oftentimes, the city franchise required the trolley system to clean the street, to sweep the street of snow. You had the electric wire system to maintain overhead. So the motor bus was much more flexible, and if traffic dwindled in one area, the bus could be diverted to other areas. Um, there is a famous case that goes to the United States Supreme Court. And there was a firm called National City Lines, which bought up trolley systems across the country, including here in Bloomington. And what they quickly did was get rid of trolleys. And the major owners of National City Lines were General Motors, Firestone, Standard Oil, Philip 66, and uh, Mack Truck Company. And as they'd get rid of the trolley, they would put on the, uh, put on the motor bus as a substitute. And eventually it did go to a court case. They were not convicted per se of killing urban transit systems, but they were convict convicted of uh, basically conspiring for um, market dominance in terms of only buying from the companies that were owners. The fines were very minimal. Uh, General Motors was fined $5,000. General Motors treasurer was fined $1. In the 1970s, many cities came back to electric transit, which became known as light rail systems. And these tend to run not so much in city streets as to designated private right-of-ways where they're not dodging traffic, but can actually go through an urban area and then go out onto a 
more private rail system to reach out into the outer suburbs. So in a sense, there's a trolley comeback. Photo here on the left is some of the vintage cars in San Francisco, which San Francisco has repainted in paint schemes of uh, numerous cities that once operated trolleys across the United States. So we've been on the ground. Now let's talk about going up. So if the streets are congested, the streets are full of horses, streets are full of people, what if you go overhead and build a transit system that can go above the street? And that became the elevated railway. And by the 1850s, we're already seeing proposals. Here's one that was never built, but written about in Scientific American Magazine in 1853, of basically putting a steam locomotive on top, a railway system over the city street with a uh, carriage that would be underneath it which could go from stop to stop and go much faster than the, uh, than the average street-borne traffic that could, could move with it. Another really fascinating idea from New York at this time period was not a rail system, but a traveling sidewalk. So think about when you go to an airport and you get on a sidewalk that takes you down a long corridor. This was to be a wooden system that would be pulled by cables and would go above the city street with the idea that the uh, streets would be left to horses and to that kind of traffic, but people would be off the street and going from building to building with a second floor entrance off buildings and uh, just basically strolling or just watching along this elevated railway there were cars proposed on this that you could sit on. And if you wanted to pay a nickel fare, you could have a seat. Or there were these salons, little enclosed compartments, which would be heated in the winter. Actually, it was very seriously considered in New York City. The legislature approved it, but twice the governor of New York vetoed it. And again, I don't know if that was because of he wasn't getting his share of the payoff or some internal conflict between New York City politicians versus upstate politicians, but it was certainly a, a novel proposal for the time period. Um, in 1867, a overhead cable railway was opened in New York City. And again, we see the inventor here in his uh, little propelled cart, rail cart, that's being pulled by cable was attempted to run it, but it really was not very functional because the cable system was not reliable in terms of keeping the uh, cars running in any consistency. So this company went under, but was quickly bought up and replaced with a steam railway. And so now you had people on street level and above your head, you had steam locomotives running, um, pulling carts. Um, and just imagine if you've been around a steam locomotive, you've got smoke, you've got cinders, and you've got boiling water and that occasionally comes out through the flues and, and the uh, side. So if you're underneath one, it's not very pleasant and uh, adds to kind of the pollution of the urban environment. A lot of controversy, but in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, a number of cities, these elevated railways quickly were built because they came a very fast and speedy way to move folks away from, away from the city center and into outlying areas where residential areas were. It was, uh, was very popular and of course still survives. The great Chicago L system is probably the most famous survivor of that. Um, Chicago's Southside Elevated opened in 1892 and Chicago was the first city where the electric where the steam railways were electric, electrified. So, you know, when you ride the Chicago L or subway today, you're running on an electric car. It was Frank Sprague, the same guy that uh, perfected trolley technology in Richmond, Virginia, perfected the electrical technology for the uh, elevated railway. And the famous Chicago Loop was something that Yerkes put together to bring they were not one company, but four different companies, bring them all together in Chicago together to loop the downtown. So when we think of the term Chicago loop, it really did come from uh, this street rail or this elevated railway system that looped the downtown of the city. 
not just big cities. The photograph here is the short-lived Sioux City Rapid Transit, which was a similar elevated railway which ran from the bluffs where the wealthier people lived to the uh, downtown of Sioux City. Did not have a long life, but again, the, the elevated railway was a technology tried in more than one place. And this is one of the more fun or fascinating system was Joseph Miggs. And because of the elaborate bridge structures that were required to um, carry steam locomotives, Miggs came up with this idea of basically building a monorail, a one rail system, which would take up less space to build up, but then came up with this kind of, you know, if you want to call it an early streamlined design of a steam powered railway train which would run along the monorail and uh, would become an alternative or less less intrusive system than the uh, elevated railways were actually built this prototype tried his technology it was in cambridge massachusetts could not convince the city of boston to use it um, but again, it's, it's kind of a very fascinating and really interesting looking piece of technology. Underground. We've gone, we've gone on the surface. We've gone above. What about going underground? And the city of London opened the first underground railway or subway in 1863. Big challenge of it is it was steam powered. So imagine yourself in a underground cavern with a steam loco multiple steam locomotives running through it, producing all their smoke and cinders and all that that comes with it. So here's a, a little video we're gonna look at here that uh, this is a uh, re, I gotta find my, there we go. This is a restoration of a uh, London steam railway car. Um, and again, run through the city streets, but particularly are underneath the city. But look at some of the costumes people are wearing here too. It's, it's punk, steampunk punks will. First time we hauled passengers to the train on the original of the underground in 1905. It's, it's, we've restored it in partnership with its owners. It was uh, a dead engine uh, until uh, until last year, and we raised money from uh, individual donors uh, and from the ticket sales on the train to uh, overhaul the locomotive uh, and put it back into action again. So at the least, that will give you a little sense of Sorry. This is the first time we've hauled passengers with a steam train on the original section of the underground. So my apologies that we uh, got diverted there a few times, but you can understand how um, this was not necessarily a very healthy environment to be underground 
with a uh, steam trains running and uh, a lot of smoke cinders and congestion with that. So um, that was uh, a drawback of, of this system. And I'm gonna do a little adjustment here and uh, we will continue on with this. because I don't want this video to come up again. There we go. Okay, here's another option. And I think this would make Elon Musk very jealous. Alfred Beach, the editor of Scientific American, built a one block long tunnel underneath New York City and basically had a pneumatic air controlled system that pulled this little car underneath the city it was a very early attempt at a different kind of subway that was not powered by a steam locomotive. It was very popular. People came just to ride it for the one block and he wanted to extend this underground, basically pneumatic tube system throughout the city. Um, but the Astors and some of the other prominent families in New York opposed it because they felt it would undermine the foundation of their buildings. Of course, the limitation of a tube system like this is you could only propel one car at a time of any length. So it would be very difficult to get multiple cars running on a system like this. But another one of the innovations that were attempted to uh, create an underground system. U.S. subway took off in 1897 in Boston. And the photograph here is constructing the New York City subway in 1904. And if you've ever ridden the New York City subway, particularly the older sections of it, um, some really beautiful inlay tile work, um, art deck, kind of terracotta work, some stained glass, and some, you look at the older stations along the New York system, there's really very artistically done and often with artwork are the tiles would have something that would match with the part of the city. So for instance, if you're near the Astor Place, station, the tiles there have beavers. And of course, the beavers were how the Astors made their money was the beaver trade in the um, early 19th century um, shipping beavers around the world. So um, kind of kind of a fun urban archaeology to go revisit those. Probably the world's most elaborate is the Moscow subway built during the 1930s to show that um, the proletariat of the Soviet Union could enjoy the finer things of life. So if you want to ride a subway with chandeliers and fine art in it, go to Moscow. One of the things that, again, as the subways, as transit systems became part of people's lives, for many years, from 1941 to 1976, this is um, very sexist, but New York City had a Miss Subway. And every week or two, a young woman who rode the subway would be highlighted with signs within the subway cars. But what's kind of interesting with this is when Miss America and other beauty pageant things were very white, um, Miss Subway here in 1948 is African-American. In 1954 is uh, Chinese-American. So the, the Miss Subway kind of reflected the diversity of the city. And uh, so it's kind of an interesting little um, part of subway lore in New York City. You know, it was in a sense to connect the system with its riders. Um, Miss Subway was revived in 2017. And uh, as you can read the caption here, Miss Subway 2019 was crowned with a wreath of plastic rats, troll dolls, and rhinestone unicorns. Um, just kind of a very campy, um, show for people from all kinds of different backgrounds, um, just how outrageous could they be with their costuming. Um, just great fun to kind of, again, salute the subway, but in a very down to earth way. Um, the photograph here is the uh, 2019 winner um, who performs in a punk band. And again, these are not gender specific entries in uh, the Miss Subway contest, just the way that people again, are kind of mocking, but also celebrating their public transit system. Um, two more we'll look at real quickly that are not as common, but are other people movers, are the funiculars. Um, this 
One on the center top here is Cincinnati, the Mount Adams incline. And again, this is a car or bridge system that runs up an elevated railway and mounted this part of the city. The one in Cincinnati was big enough to carry wagons, trucks, and trolley cars up and down from one part of the city to another. You can still ride the Duquesne incline in Pittsburgh and get a beautiful view over the Three Rivers area. Again, in 1870s construction, a uh, Angel's Flight in Los Angeles was relocated and removed to another area, but is operating again. And in our Midwestern area, if you ever go over to Dubuque, there is the uh, funicular railway in Dubuque, which are these very tiny little cars that um, seat about four people and uh, goes up and down the hill side of Dubuque on a regular basis every day. Um, the cars kind of act as counterweights. So as one is pulled up, the other is coming down. So they kind of pull each other up and down on the uh, cable system. The other one finally is the monorail. And this is the, and I won't even try to say it because I'm not a German speaker, but the um, first, first monorail in the world was opened in 1901 in Germany. This still operates. It's uh, kind of a very fascinating vintage system, but instead of um, the cars running on top of the system, they run underneath it, hanging suspended from a single rail. And of course, here in the United States, we associate monorails with the uh, Disney properties or the Seattle World's Fair, besides the Space Needle, was the Seattle monorail, which took people to and from the fairgrounds and is still operating today. Um, by the 1920s, private transit companies were losing money. Um, they had to maintain their street railway systems. Usually, fares were regulated, and no politician wanted to vote against a nickel fare. So many of these companies began to go bankrupt. And so that's when transit made the transition from private companies to public service systems. And you see here some of the various different um, systems beginning in San Francisco and things like the CTA in Chicago that took over the subways, the elevated railways, the bus lines, the uh, trolley systems and uh, operated them as a public utility and not as a profit-making venture. We're going to leave here with Ms. Judy Garland and we get this to work right and she's going to take us out for a little jolly ride on the trolley from the film Meet me in St. Louis, and then we'll have time for questions. Thank you. And I think we're ready for any comments or questions, right? Yeah, thank you, Mike, so much for that fascinating program. And I loved all the images of all the different methods of transportation. We do have a few questions. Uh, first off is uh, Jim Bertolette asked, he heard that Goodyear and Ford bought up some of the city transit systems so they would have to use tires and engines to operate. Is there any truth to this? Well, and that's where I think what was mentioned earlier was the National City Lines, which was not Goodyear and Ford, but was Firestone and General Motors. Um, and again, the, um, it's reputed they were tried. Um, whether or not that was the cause of the total demise, but they certainly did take off a lot of electric trolley systems and replace them with GM buses running on standard oil and uh, with Firestone tires on them. So you've got the general concept, but a uh, different set of firms. Oh, fascinating. Uh, Diane Hollister wanted to know, what happened to the MIG tube cylinder cars? Are they in a museum now? I find them fascinating. Yeah, and what was, you know, was built in the 1870s and the country went into depression in 1873, it was shut. And then in 1912, 1913, a new building was being built and they found this whole system underground. But I don't think a few pieces of it were saved, but not any of the, uh, the cars that ran along the pneumatic tubes. But it was kind of an urban archaeology discovery of a uh, hundred years ago is is to find this uh, tube system under New York City streets. Oh, wow. That is fascinating. <laughs> wow. I guess, like, for a question I have, do you have a favorite era of transportation history? 
You know, that's, that's a good question because, you know, in that time period of right after World War II, particularly during the war, a lot of this vintage older equipment got hauled out just because there was so much movement needed during the war. And because of rubber and gasoline rationing, people went back to public transit. So you have these more modern, we call the PCC Art Deco trolley systems. And at the same time, you've got a lot of older equipment that's kind of getting a new lease on life, at least for a few years during, during the uh, World War II and post-World War II era, when people are often against their will, have to leave their car in the garage and have to go back to public transit again. But you get a, a real interesting mix of technologies and equipment during that time period. The one I wish the inner urban was still around because it ran through where I live in Wapella. And so that would be a great way that I could commute every day to Bloomington. It would be such an easy, easy thing for me. Yeah. And I see, um, I see the question there from Diane about the traction, the inner urban equipment. Yes. Um, and we don't know if they actually ran through Bloomington Normal, but in Union, Illinois, up by Rockford is the Illinois Railway Museum. And they've got a collection of about 10 to 15 different cars that ran on the inner urban. Or if you go south to St. Louis, the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis has seven or eight of those cars. So don't know if they exactly ever ran through here, but both the freight motors, the freight cars, and the electric inner urban cars um, are well preserved, those two museums. And occasionally in Union, Illinois, they do have an operating railway there. They bring them out a couple times a year and run them. So uh, might be fun to check their schedule and, and see when they might be running some of that vintage equipment. And to answer the other part, no, Diane, we do not have any cars in the museum's collection. We would have nowhere to put such a piece, but wouldn't that be fun if we did have larger pieces of history? Absolutely. Uh, Jeff asked, uh, what are the possibilities of, say, autonomous vehicle technology making a modern inner urban in the area of a reality, for example, between Champaign and Bloomington? Yeah, that's a great question because you think of autonomous vehicles, um, we tend to think of those as individualized little pods, but there's no reason it could not be a larger vehicle like a bus or a rail car, you know, that could haul 20, 30, 40 people back and forth at one time. Um, you know, some of this is a side note, but it took me a while to catch on to this one. If you're in Uptown Normal by the Hyatt any morning, you see this Timmy's tour bus pulling up in front of the Hyatt. That's Rivian. Rivian is shuttling people from uptown out to the plant in tour buses. A bus just makes a loop all day long back and forth from the plant. And Rivian is putting some people up at the Hyatt. But uh, again, Rivian has kind of created their own transportation system to have less cars in the parking lot and, uh, just have a uh, shuttle bus taking people out to the uh, to the plant. Wow, that I did not know. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and oh, go ahead. I saw the question there from Sonia. Yes. Yeah. The underpass by where Vernon Avenue meets um, Vernon Avenue meets Buford. There's a small underpass there. And that was originally built so that the trolleys to from Bloomington to Normal would not have to cross the railroad tracks with the danger of collision. So that underpass, I think, was built in, I want to say, 1910, 1912 kind of time period. And you can still drive underneath it. But that's one of the remnants of the Bloomington Normal Street Railway is that little uh, almost single lane underpass uh, in Normal. It's great, great point, Sonia, for a uh, little bit, again, ar urban archaeology. That's great. And Diane asked if anyone can take the shuttle bus to Rivian. I think that's just for their employees, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it might throw them a little bit, particularly since last week somebody tried to steal the bus. <gasps> oh, so, wow. And took a joy ride on it. So I think they're very careful about who gets on the bus. I missed that one in the news. Wow, fascinating. What looks like
like. That is all the questions we have. And I do want to remind folks um, that we have another program coming up next Tuesday, June 8th at 6 o'clock, the next installment of our Breaking Bread program. This time uh, will be the uh, Kickapoo Food and Remedies. Uh, Lester Randall, the tribal chairman of the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas, is going to join us for that presentation. And I did throw the link in the chat box, um, but you can also find it on our website. Uh, I do want to thank all of you again for joining us uh, this afternoon and hope we see you at future programs coming up. So have a good rest of the day. Take care well, and be well. Yes, we need yes. a final bong, right? There, do it. Yes. Thank you, Mike, and thank all of you.